people rem uh, remember we have been uh, we, we have shared uh, many many scientific adventure in several places and, uh, and during different times uh, and you remind me of my beginning so um i just want to try to share my slide so you need to enable me to share share screen uh, that should be it right yes you see them yes correct correct perfect uh, let me do something about this. Okay, all right, we should be able to get to go. All right, so uh, the title uh, is, yeah, uh, more or less what you uh, envisioned. Uh, so it's genetic cholangiopathy, is the Rosetta Stone to translate the liver. And um, it's, a, it's a tale for uh, physician scientists in a way. And uh, at my, um, at my age, because I'm younger than you, but <laughs> not so much, um, it's always nice to go back and, and ask yourself, why did I end up there? Why did I end up here, actually, doing uh, uh, with, with this interest? Uh, and uh, there's a, there is a poem for a very famous um, uh, American poet, uh, which is Robert Frost, uh, he was the preferred po poet of JFK, who says it all. He says, two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by. And that make, and that's made all the difference. So why are, am I studying cholangiopathies rather than hepatitis B, C, ascites, and every and, and many other very exciting uh, topics uh, in, in the liver. And I think it has something to do with the beginning. In my beginning at the University of Padova, I started studying the mitochondria physiology. Then I switched to familiar hyperbilirubinemia, as you know, working with Professor Colicciani. And from there, develop an interest in progressive familiar intrahepatic cholestasis, and that led us to the primary, now primary biliary cholangitis, and an interest to the cells that are the target of these diseases. So in a, in a uh, fellowship uh, at the university many, many years ago, study with, with Jim Boyer, we kind of described the um, mechanism through which the biliary epithelium secretes uh, electrolyte and water during the digestive phases. And uh, in particular, we uh, focus on, on two membrane transport and on the apical side. One is the anion exchange of two, and the other is uh, the cystic fibrosis conductor regulator. And they work in concert uh, to generate a bicarbonate rich hypercolorases. At this point, um, Jim and I started to two different routes. He kept he kept following the uh, B, uh, bile acid star, <laughs> and I venture into uh, more uh, le less known waters, and and decided that actually there was a lot of uh, a lot was interesting about these tubes and conduits called biliary tree, and therefore. I started my journey uh, in trying to understand these diseases. And uh, I can say that one of the reasons why uh, we did this is because they are challenging. They are difficult. At, the, at that time, there was not uh, very many ways uh, to address them experimentally. But they are relevant diseases because they are chronic invalidating diseases of unknown pathogenesis and still mostly of unknown therapy. They are rare, but as a group, they are frequent. As you see here, several, one of the classification of cholangiopathies, and we'll touch about a few of them, uh, but they can be genetic, immune-mediated, infectious, and malignant. Uh, and, and also, uh, while less relevant in the adult, uh, they actually uh, represent the most um, <laughs> frequent indication for liver transplantation in children. And, and from uh, the translational point of view, they are a great model to study epithelial inflammation, epithelial reaction to damage, 
and the mechanism of tissue regeneration in the liver. So plenty to do and a very interesting topic, at least to my eyes. A few years later, um, while uh, hiking in the Alps uh, with Nicolas LaRusso and uh, having a stop uh, in this little hut called Rastua, we started to draw on a little napkin. And we kind of draw the general theory that has guided our approach to cholangiopathy. So several different uh, injuries may damage the liver, but they always generate an inflammatory response which can resolve or depending on several other com conditions and including genetic makeup of the host will lead to chronic inflammation. The hallmark of chronic inflammation in, uh, in the liver in the biliary tree is what we call the ductular reaction, which was described by uh, Valérie Desmay and correctly uh, pointed out as being the pacemaker of biliary fibrosis. In this mechanism, we can recognize some elemental, elemental lesion, right? Like cholestasis, uh, ductopenia or senescence, fibrosis, and all the way to liver cancer. So this is the general, uh, the general hypothesis uh, that we have addressed uh, and we are still following. And uh, that a napkin uh, with a sketch became a, a paper in 2004. But one of the problem with this was that the adult cholangiopathies, uh, PSC, PBC, are very complex systems. And in order to uh, dissect this pathway, we needed uh, more uh, experimentally focused uh, approach. And this is how um, I kind of envisage that genetic cholangiopathies could be the way to translate um, the pathophysiological mechanisms happening. And, and through the year, we actually study several of them. All of them, each of them represents a potential pathogenetic mechanism. So for example, MDR3 deficiency is a great model for uh, biliary uh, damage induced by bile acid and fibrosis. Um, the ductal plate malformation teach us, teaches us a, about liver development. Allergy syndrome, we'll see. <laughs> I'm gonna briefly touch upon it. The adult dominant uh, polycystic uh, liver disease is an example of angiogenic signaling in the liver and the ciliary uh, signaling in the liver. Congenital hepatic fibrosis is another disease that will touch upon it. And so by addressing this condition, they have a identified gene, uh, a, a disease, um, mouse models, they are better experimental models to try to get some answer. In the remaining of my talk, I'll try to show what kind of answer you can get. And I will not delve into the um, specific experiments. So you have to trust me a little bit, okay? So the uh, ductal reaction, which is basically the epithelial component of biliary repair, you see two examples here. One, this is an acute hepatitis, drug induced. This is PSC chronic, but you can distinguish here several elements of the ductal reaction. The, he, the, these are the reactive ductal cells that are cords without really a defined lumen among inflammatory cells. These are the progenitor cell uh, that are these and these, okay? Now it's all called progenitor cell, but that's a mistake. These are the real progenitor cell, the single cell that you see here. And these are intermediate uh, hepatobiliary cells that we still don't know if they are in transit to become hepatocyte or to become biliary cells or what. So this is what we knew, okay? And uh, 
I have to take back uh, one step to my uh, second nature, the one uh, of being a hepatologist and a transplant hepatologist for that matter. And one day in, uh, in, the, in the transplant clinic uh, shows up uh, a patient, a uh, young patient with um, a, a history of uh, heart disease uh, at age three, and then uh, jaundice uh, and itching at age seven, and the diagnosis of uh, allergy syndrome, Alopita Bicetre de, de Parigi, uh, in, in Paris, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, what is allergy syndrome? Allergy syndrome is a developmental liver disease in which you have a um, uh, lack of uh, uh, small biliary duct and the patient becomes um, jaundice and itching. It is due to a faulty notch signaling mechanism. And it's kind of uh, interesting because for the level of jaundice, uh, the level of fibrosis is not as um, severe. Anyway, our patient had uh, elevation of bilirubin uh, and uh, Really, his, his liver uh, after 24 years was uh, was failing. Therefore, we transplanted him. After the transplant, we were very curious to look at his liver because you know we were expecting. Uh, we don't know we were well expecting, but we were very curious to see how deep was the duct opinion and so on. And so we uh, took his liver and uh, do some cytokeratin staining. And all and behold, this is what we saw. This is cytokeratin seven and. Uh, these are intermediate hepatobiliary cells. We couldn't see ductal reaction here, not of the kind we were expecting, but we did see all these uh, small hepatocyte staying with this cytokeratin 7 with a membranose uh, uh, pattern. When we look better and compared it with a biliary atresia, and we saw that. In the biliary atresia, we didn't have all these intermediate cells. Uh, we did have the cytokeratin 19 ductal reaction that was absent uh, in allergy. And the AT125 is the same. So there was clearly an effect of uh, notch, not only on development, but also on the, in the way the liver reacted to the damage and the cholestasis. And to cut a long story short, uh, we have learned by studying experimentally this condition, we have learned that the interaction between uh, uh, JAG1 uh, in mesenchymal cells and NOTCH1 and 2 in the biliary cells, it's not only important for the biliary specification and for the uh, growth of the, of the duct, but this is, becomes important also during the biliary repair because if this is an absent, uh, genetically absent in this case, your biliary repair is faulty. And here, um, uh, uh, Bolton and Bolter from uh, uh, UK expanding on this observation, showing that notch can be a switcher between two kinds of development during uh, repair. One that leads to regeneration of hepatocyte, and one when notch is on that leads to regeneration of, of, of biliary cells. So here we had a morphogen that was very interesting because if in the case of a loss of function, we had an altered liver repair or an or altered development, altered development leading to allergy, altered repair leading to more severe damage, but less fibrosis. But the gain on function was also demonstrated to be involved in uh, uh, tumorigenesis in the liver particularly in hepatocellular carcinoma and cholangiocarcinoma. And more recently, work by other group showed that the samointrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma can actually derive from the hepatocyte through the activation of notch. So that brought to the understanding that liver repair also involve the activation of uh, a morphogenetic pathway that are uh, important during development and uh, um, 
apparently switch off in the adult life, but not completely because they can be reactivated. Among them, the WMT beta catenin, it's involved uh, in development, repair, and cancer, and is uh, out occurring. Hedgehog, the work of Anima Idea, also not signaling that we show. And the interesting thing about not signaling is that is not a secreted protein, it requires a cell-to-cell -cell contact. So one cell has the notch and another cell has the, has the jug, the ligand. And ultimately the yap tas pathway and the hippo pathway. And this is uh, again, very interesting because this is sensitive to cell shape, uh, matrix and cell density. So altogether, this morphogenetic uh, signaling collaborate and orchestrate what is uh, the uh, reparative response. And this switch from cholangiocyte to reactive cholangiocyte actually involve a very intense uh, um, exchange between uh, different cell types in the matrix. And we'll see more about that after. So fibrosis is the end result of uh, uh, this inflammation and uh, uh, signaling that happens during uh, the ductal reaction in the biliary tree, but is also the uh, mechanism of progression of uh, uh, cholangiopathy. They will start with a fibrosis around the portal uh, tract, but then it will eventually uh, create uh, a, a fibrosis extending into the lobule and uh, uh, cirrhosis. So this is the main mechanism of progression. And so far has been studied using system like bile duct ligation, the MDR2 deficiency, uh, DDC, uh, that are very interesting, useful, but somehow don't really mirror what is going on in, in the biliary tree, except for the MDR2 deficiency. While thinking about this, we came across a condition that was uh, to us very interesting, which is the congenital hepatic fibrosis. Uh, congenital hepatic fibrosis belongs to the same uh, category of disease as Caroli disease and uh, adult recessive uh, polycystic kidney disease. It's a condition that um, affects um, um, children and young adults, uh, and uh, there is a very strong uh, portal hypertension due to fibrosis in the portal spaces and, uh, and this kind of prehepatic uh, fibrosis. So uh, it turns out that this is caused by a gene, PKHD1, that uh, encodes for fibrocysting, a protein that again is uh, in the cilia of the cells, but has uh, some broad function and uh, also involved in the uh, interaction between cell cell and cell matrix. The interesting thing is of this disease is that it's a kind of um, von Meyenburg complex. Von Meyenburg complexes, as you know, are ductal plate uh, um, that don't go uh, correctly through the maturation. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with how the biliary tree develops, but the ductal plate is the beginning. These cells are hepatoblasts becoming um, the precursor of biliary cells. And it has to um, model at a certain point, incorporating the duct. In the formable complexes, this doesn't happen. And in the congenital hepatic fibrosis and other ductal plate malformation, this don't happen completely. And you end up with, with, with this complex. And as you see, there's a lot of fibrosis in this formable complex. So we uh, were lucky to have um, uh, a collaborator at Yale University that has developed the mice with a uh, fibrocysting, uh, uh, with a defect in fibrocysting. Um, and, uh, and by studying these mice, uh, we saw that there was a progressive increase in the uh, amount of cyst, a progressive uh, increase uh, in the amount of fibrosis, this is the serious red, and uh, a progressive uh, increase in inflammation around this cyst. Interestingly, for example, the fibrosis uh, 
quantified by Sirius Red was directly uh, related also to the level of splenomegaly and so on. So this was a very interesting model. In studying this model, we realized that there was some interesting uh, observation. So while the inflammation CD45 in this case is linearly increased with time, the presence of uh, myofibroblast is delayed. And uh, indeed, uh, the first cell that populate the, uh, the, uh, the cyst and the biliary tract here are uh, macrophages. Through several experimental studies, we came up with a model in which um, expression of uh, hyper, uh, upper activation of beta catenin um, were um, directing the biliary cell and the cystic cell in secreting excessive amount of certain cytokine, including CCL10, which attracts macrophages that then secretes TNF-alpha, TGF-beta, and attracts the portal fibroblast, creating the fibrosis. Indeed, uh, antibodies blocking CCR4, which is the um, receptor for CCR10, were able to slow down the, the disease. This was very interesting to us because it basically pointed out that you can have uh, fibrosis uh, originating from a defect of the biliary tree, not a necroinflammatory, not necrosis or, or, or damage. In itself, the dysfunctional biliary cell can secrete cytokines that they can then uh, uh, attract uh, macrophages and other inflammatory cells, which this is what uh, Ruslan Mezitov calls uh, uh, smoldering inflammation. What we are doing now is to use single cell RNA transcriptomics to try to dissect the population of cells that infiltrate the biliary tree. So if you isolate the biliary tree and then digest the biliary tree and then use the 10X to separate cells having a different transcriptomic profile, we end up seeing that there are several components uh, in this um, biliary tract. You know, and, and particularly, uh, we were interested in the biliary cell and, and the mesenchymal cells, but we saw that there are a lot of macrophages, as we discussed, and T cells and neutrophils. And these populations, these enrichment of population changes with time. And in fact, uh, the violet here is the um, uh, wild type, and you see how different they are through the time. The green, uh, blue is six months and nine months. So this is where we are right now. We are studying and trying to understand the relationship between these. You can calculate the RNA velocity. There are a lot of uh, approaches that you can have to try to understand how this different population interacts in the in the liver. And so. That's, that's where we are. And you know, we have also generated uh, beta catenin uh, knockout uh, linked to an albium increase. So the beta catenin is knocked out in hepatocytes and biliary cells. And see that in, a, in, a, in essence, this is true that uh, beta catenin plays a major role uh, in the development of the cyst. Furthermore, um, beta catenin uh, alone cannot do the job. And uh, as you know, it's a highly regulated uh, um, signaling pathway in uh, which be, uh, most of the beta catenin that is in the cytoplasm is actually degraded through a, a beta catenin uh, destruction complex. Uh, so it is, it is prevented to go to the nucleus. And one of the important uh, protein in this uh, complex is the YAP and TADS. And uh, in order for beta catenin to go to the nucleus, uh, YAP and TADS also must be activated somehow. And YAP and TADS is a very important, a very complex, uh, again, morphogenetic uh, mechanism that is involved uh, 
in a, uh, has to be a tightly regulated because it is involved in several um, signaling mechanisms. And so what we started to study uh, uh, YAP and TADS and in work that this is in progress, uh, we could see that there is a strong up regulation on, on nuclear YAP in, in a, uh, congenital hepatic fibrosis and TADS, they, they, they always go together. And what is interesting, Scribble, which is a protein that kind of regulate both of them, uh, is decreased. And when Scribble is uh, expressed normally, YAP and TADS uh, are not expressed in the nucleus. So there's something here that uh, relates uh, uh, to the control, to the tight control of uh, beta catenin YAP and TADS that is now working in our uh, conditions. And uh, the relevance of this is that um, both beta catenin and uh, YAP uh, control a, a growth factor, which is a connective tissue growth factor, which is important for the generation of fibrosis. And in fact, as you see here, there is a progressive increase uh, in the expression of uh, connective tissue growth factor. And also this correlates uh, with serious red uh, and, um, and uh, yes, and we YAP and TAS. So this is where we are uh, following our pathway through the um, congenital hepatic fibrosis. We are uh, understanding uh, mechanisms uh, that uh, uh, are uh, involved in the generation of fibrosis, but from a different perspective, not the perspective of the necrotic damage to the biliary tree, the perspective of the biliary cells that don't work properly and they have to reach a different uh, homeostasis. Sorry that uh, the, light, <laughs> the light switched off. All right, and now back to the back to where we be, we began. Uh, and uh, if you remember, uh, I started my uh, uh, my chat uh, discussing um, the role of CFTR and and uh, the anion exchanger in the generation of bicarbonate rich bile. Well, there is a disease which is caused by lack of CFTR, and as you all know, it's called cystic fibrosis. And for years and years, for our uh, biliary physiologists, this has been uh, the um, kind of the example of the fact that if you don't have a biliary secretion, you will not, you will have a, a cholestasis and, and a damage and a cholangiopathy. And um, in fact, the patient with cystic fibrosis, some of them develop liver disease and can be severe. And we did transplant a few of these uh, young patients with, with liver cirrhosis. And the, so the explanation that we all were giving to this syndrome, as, as I uh, briefly hinted, is that lack of uh, CFTR in the apical membrane would lead to a decrease by carbonate uh, and biliary secretion. And this would lead to a thick inspissated bile that eventually would damage the cell to the cholestasis and generate uh, an inflammatory response uh, with the uh, uh, activation of proper fibroblasts and so on. So this was the classic explanation that we gave ourselves for, for many, many years. Uh, However, um, there's a thing that uh, while all uh, patients with cystic fibrosis has a, have a reduced uh, biliary uh, secretion at, at the ductal level, uh, liver disease happens only in, uh, in a minority of them. So there was a second hit. You need to have a second hit in order to develop this. But what is the second hit? Can be anything, but no, but no second hit has been identified really uh, so far. And um, um, several years ago, a group in Boston, Friedman, um, published a paper in which it showed that if you take mice uh, with defective CFTR that are known to have a very mild biliary uh, biliary damage, and you create a colitis using DSS, hold and behold, uh, the mice has significant biliary inflammation and disease. We replicated this experiment, and indeed it was true that mice with colitis lacking CFTR in the liver were, and, and the intestine were actually um, 
undergoing significant biliary damage. Interestingly, when we repeated this experiment in mice treated with no UDCA, which is a derivative of, of UDCA and is causing hypercholeresis. So while correcting the uh, biliary secretion in these mice didn't lead to an improvement uh, in the uh, liver pathology. So it was something different from uh, the lack uh, of secretion in this condition. And uh, when we treated these mice with non-absorbable antibiotics, we did decrease the level of inflammation in the liver. Um, and uh, it makes sense. You know, at that time, we our hypothesis was that uh, the colitis would increase the endotoxin in the portal circulation. As we know, endotoxin are taken up by the hepatocyte that can be secreted intact in the biliary tree. And, and, and for some reason, having endotoxin in the biliary tree would uh, create a different response uh, in, uh, in the biliary tree of CFTR uh, knockout mice uh, respect to the wild type. And in fact, to different uh, um, studies and experiments that are not going into, into the detail, we came up with the theory that um, CFTR docking at the membrane uh, would create a um, complex, a multi-protein uh, complex here, able to control the uh, SRC kinase that uh, in cell lacking the CFTR would otherwise um, phosphorylate and activate TLR4. They will respond uh, um, with enhanced inflammation to the presence on LPS. This was our explanation at the time, but then we decided to expand this, this um, uh, working hypothesis. And currently we are uh, studying two um, possible further mechanism. One uh, is the impact of potential changes in microbiota in the, in the, in the in the cystic fibrosis mice. And the other is the impact uh, of uh, specific CFTR mutation on cholangiocyte biology. You know that there are 1,000 different mutations belonging to five different classes. They have different severity. So for this uh, uh, part of the study, which I'm not going to touch upon today, we are using uh, IPSC derived uh, cholangiocyte uh, in which we have inserted the uh, desired mutation using the increased Cas9 technology. I'm going to show you some of our preliminary results uh, uh, that concern the uh, impact of the potential changes in microbiota. So, our uh, experimental approach in this case was to compare the microbiota at different uh, stages and condition in three mouse line. One is the wild type that has CFTR in the liver and the intestine. One is the CFTR knockout mice, which is a global knockout. So CFTR is lacking from the intestine and from, uh, from the liver and from the intestine. And the third one is the uh, CFTR uh, KOGC mice in which the um, is the KO mice and the CFTR, human CFTR has been inserted uh, into the intestine through genetic uh, means, okay? So by comparing these three conditions and comparing the microbiota composition, the intestine, the level of intestinal uh, inflammation permeability and uh, liver damage, uh, the amount of damage in the liver inflammation, and also uh, we are looking at the translocation of live bacteria. I'm gonna give you just a few hints about this. This will be presented by Romina Fiorotto at the SLD in a couple of weeks. But what we found uh, by examining the feces of the mice is that the, in the CFTR knockout, uh, there is a, a decreased uh, diversity 
in the MI, in the uh, microbiota of the mice. Uh, and this is present both at the weaning and after six weeks in which these are co-housed. So both the normal, the wild type uh, and the uh, KO mice are housed in the same cage so that they eventually can cross contaminate uh, by eating their feces. This is another way to show the diversity. And you see that the uh, microbiota of the wild type and the gut corrected mice is strongly different from the microbiota of the uh, CF uh, knockout mice. This is true at three weeks and this is also true at se after six weeks of co-housing in both cases. If we go and look at the composition of the microbiota, it turns out that there is an increase uh, in the uh, knockout mice of uh, the um, gamma proteobacteria. And further studies are confirming and giving a name to this uh, gamma proteobacteria. And this will be presented by Romina again at the SLD. But what is interesting also to us is that if we compare the degree of liver damage in our three mice, we see that liver damage in the CFTR got corrected, that has CFTR in the intestine, but not in the liver, is actually the same. I mean, the, the, the cytokeratin and the inflammation is the same that we see in the wild type mice. Whereas in the CFTR KO, we have damage, increase, significantly increased damage. As if what really mattered was the absence of uh, uh, CFTR from the intestine. And it's also interesting because if we take um, these uh, livers and we run a, a cytokine microarray for the protein, we see that there is a clearly a strong difference in the in increasing inflammation from the CFTR knockout mice and the wild type. With the CFTR KOGC, they got corrected kind of in the middle, but more similar to the wild type mice. So again, what really matters here is the um, relationship between the defect in the biliary tree, but also the defect imposed by lack of CFTR in the intestine, promoting a more pathogenetic um, microflora and uh, microbiota there. And uh, I was, it was very interesting when I saw these uh, uh, results because I have to admit, uh, I started not as a believer on the microbiota thing, but it really seems to make a big difference. So, and, and this is true, you know, this is becoming true also in other, in other areas of cholangiopathies, you know, like uh, primary sclerosis and cholangitis, by the way, cystic fibrosis is a, is a cause of secondary sclerosis and cholangitis. So there are several data that are um, pointing in the direction of uh, exploring further the relationship between uh, uh, the microbiota and, and, and the liver. And so uh, this combination may have uh, uh, a translational uh, importance because uh, through these studies, we kind of identified several potential therapeutic targets that we haven't explored yet and probably will be the next five years. So we can use uh, CFTR modulators, we can use probiotics, antibiotics. Um, now you can use phages to um, eliminate specific bacteria if you identify them. But also, we could use uh, anti-inflammatories because we could demonstrate the inflammation actually is not really uh, decreased bile secretion to my disappointment. <laughs> it is increased inflammation in the liver that actually is doing the, is uh, 
is causing the progression of uh, the transport defect into uh, full-blown biliary uh, and liver disease uh, in cystic fibrosis. So these are three examples that I wanted to briefly show you to kind of um, um, highlight how much we can understand by studying rare and genetic diseases. And so what did we learn? And this is just a uh, summary of it. We learned that the alter inflammatory responses are the main pathophysiological mechanism that acquire and genetic epithelial cell dysregulation leads to alter cellular homeostasis. And this is the primary cause for inflammatory changes in chronic condition. The alter homeostasis of the biliary cell, which is then calling the inflammation around, that the pathologic biliary repair leads to biliary fibrosis and is a main mechanism of progression. That the pathologic repair is then orchestrated by reactivation of morphogenetic system that were previously involved in liver development. And this can play a role and plays a role also in the development of, of liver cancer. And as the process progresses, there are further uh, cellular interaction that we are going to address by single cell transcriptomics that may further amplify the inflammation. And finally, the changes in, in the intestinal microbiota contribute to sustain and most likely amplify the inflammatory changes. And the next step is that this mechanism that we studied and uh, simplified the uh, experimental mechanism uh, setup probably can become target for the disease. And once we have developed target for these uh, rare conditions, we may even find something that is helpful in the more frequent uh, uh, adult cholangiopathies. So if I have uh, a few more minutes, um, I like to make the point that to go into the translational phase, we need to have models. Models that goes beyond, they go beyond uh, the um, mouse, uh, mouse line and cells. And, and, and we have now the means and the way to develop uh, cellular models that are relevant for human disease. And this is, for example, what we offer at the liver center at Yale. So um, from patient, we can derive uh, blood samples that, as you know, can be reprogrammed uh, into uh, iPSC cells. And this can be then differentiated. I didn't show you our studies with um, iPSC derived uh, Delta F508 uh, cystic fibrosis cholangiocyte, but they're very interesting and they reproduce most of the defects that we saw in vitro with mouse. And also we can generate from pieces of liver tissue, we can generate uh, uh, organoids, but also monolayer of cells. And I want to leave you with, with our latest uh, development in the, in the field of organoids, uh, which is the, what we call the um, inside out organoids. So this is a regular organoid grown out of a liver biopsy. Um, the uh, apical membrane is inside, faces this lumen. And you can see here the ZO1 and beta catenin. you can see uh, how they are uh, uh, oriented with the basolateral membrane outside of the lumen inside. But we discover that if you take away beta-1 integrin, this organoid flips and expose the uh, apical membrane in the outside and the, therefore make it accessible to many more studies. I want to show you uh, what happens here. Hope you can see it. This is taking out beta-1 integrin. You see that flips over and here you go. And beta catenin Z, uh, Z1, apical membrane inside and then eventually they form a vacuole. 
Uh, and this is a very interesting way to study because uh, we also discovered that it takes only one tenth of the um, uh, integrin uh, that you find in the matrigel to keep the uh, organoid in the classic configuration. And therefore this will um, facilitate studies in the interaction between immune cells and, and cholangiocytes that otherwise are too difficult to be performed uh, in uh, when the cells is in, uh, organoid is embedded into the matrix. Okay, um, right. <laughs> I'm trying to get off. All right, so um, at the end of this journey, I, 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 there are several people that I need to thank. Uh, Tullio Pozzan, who introduced me to the secret of uh, mitochondria and cell biology. Professor Colizzani that introduced me to um, biliary secretion and bilirubin metabolism. Giovanella Baggio, who teach me uh, clinical medicine. Jim Boyer, which is my mentor and uh, my colleague here at Yale University. Professor Crepaldi, who uh, taught me how to run a department. Uh, and, and Bruno Gridelli, who really taught me all I needed to do about liver transplantation. And in addition to that, many more uh, of my uh, present and, and um, former mentee, and in particular um, to uh, Romina and Valeria Mariotti that were involved in uh, most of the studies that uh, are ongoing now. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much to you. I mean, it was excellent presentation, Mario, uh, as largely expected. Uh, there's any question, uh, comments, uh, uh, suggestions, uh, critiques? Please, don't be shy. But while the other will uh, make up their minds, I'd like to point one thing, which in my opinion may be relevant. I mean, I, I love the, your idea to go back and uh, uh, go back in the ancient times when everything started. <laughs> And I understand, probably uh, I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, that one of the, the fil rouge connecting all your beautiful data and all the data uh, presented and collected is still inflammation. And inflammation goes back to the early uh, 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 21st century when everything was inflammation, which means that nothing new under the sun. And I think that I wonder whether you think that by, uh, I mean, turning uh, the, um, the inflammation, the inflammatory reaction may really change the outcome of these this, this disorders. I mean, uh, preventing uh, progression and then preventing the need for ectotopic transplantation. And I think that your uh, experimental data support this view. Uh, this is my first question. My second question is about the microbiota. Uh, I'm uh, uh, concerned about uh, where is the, the chicken and the egg? I mean, is the microbiota uh, the, um, responsible for the damage or is the damage responsible for the change of microbiota? And this is sort of a vicious circle. And I want you to, con to, uh, to uh, comment on that. Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, I, I, I agree with you. All goes back to inflammation, uh, but the inflammation we were discussing 30 years ago was like the airplane of the Wright brothers, right? <laughs> <laughs> now information has uh, many, many more nuances. And uh, the kind of information we are interested in is more the innate immune system. Uh, although um, if you look at um, how many T cells we isolated by, through our single cell transcriptomics, it all, at the end, it all connects. And um, it's, you know, it makes a lot of sense that inflammation uh, is at the basis um, because it's the way we react to a damage. I mean, there's no question about it. I mean, what, what, we, what we try to do and, and partly successfully, hopefully, and there will be a NIAS conference in Florence uh, in May about biliary fibrosis that will be organized by um, Mike, uh, by um, Massimo Pinzani and me. And so it's, it's basically kind of reversing the optics 
So inflammation and fibrosis have been observed to the optics of uh, the mesenchymal cell. But the mesenchymal cell is the first line, is, is, is basically the fire department coming to, <laughs> to the fire, but who calls the fire department? The damage that occurs in the uh, epithelial cells. So they are there to repair an epithelial wound. And therefore, kind of the brain behind the whole orchestration, it, it sits in the, into the epithelial um, cells. So the way we tried to address this, it was uh, epitheliocentric. Uh, the reality, of course, lies in between, as always. But there was the different optics that we decided to take. And uh, I think, in part, uh, uh, now it's an accepted uh, uh, vision. It wasn't uh, when Nick and I uh, were hiking into the Alps. But it's more accepted. Then your, your second question uh, pertains to the microbiota. Um, and the way you frame the question is really also um, part of the answer, right? So you were, you were asking, is the chicken or the egg? And it's both. <laughs> 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 because the- Philosophical uh, and political, my friend. <laughs> right, you know, not to be political, but if you think about and, and again, I was not a believer on the microbiota story, okay? But the same defect, it's the same defect, which is a lack of safety art. It has different uh, impact uh, in different organs. And uh, in the liver, it reduces, you know, it creates a more inflammatory, uh, pro-inflammatory environment, it reduces by secretion and so on, but it's not enough. It's not that it is not there. It's not enough to become of clinical consequence. Mm -hmm. But if you also have troubles in your CFTR and the environment that the CFTR uh, defect creates in the, in the belly and how, what kind of species find a better environment there, uh, it makes a difference because it's probably what is needed to tilt the thing toward the canyon, right? To mm -hmm. tilt it toward uh, the disease. Now, from here to humans, there's a lot of steps, right? Uh, although these uh, defects were found also in human samples, but uh, we need to understand that, you know, these patients are on anti antibiotic treatment for their life. So th there's a lot, there's a lot that comes from uh, this experimental uh, simplification uh, to then uh, a full translation to humans. However, from the pathophysiological point of view, it, it <laughs> I have to admit that it is convincing uh, at least in, in the framework of, uh, of our experimental conditions. Okay, I'm convinced. Any yeah. other question? Uh, okay, if not... Uh, uh, no, uh, yeah, uh, for what I remember of two, more than two decades ago, the CFTR model of the mouse was not a good CFTR model for humans because there was no lung involvement or very little. Is that correct still today? They, uh, in part, uh, in part is correct. Uh, it seems that when the mouse age, the mice age, uh, then uh, uh, more damage uh, is present in the lung and also in the liver. Uh, there are there are models that are uh, um, that develop spontaneous disease, but those are models that you, you know, very difficult to to use, like the uh, the pig, for example. Okay, those are. Uh, but then again, um, the reason, one of the reasons why the, uh, the liver of the mice is relatively protected, it seems that they have uh, um, a more um, active uh, calcium dependent 
explore the channels. Mm. No, but, but the question was, well, I know that all the CFTR patients are under a life antibiotic treatment, but yeah. did you did you have a chance to look at uh, younger patients at the time that they are diagnosed? And maybe at that point, you can look at the, and the microbiota and see how it compares with the children of the same age or things like that, no? That will help you to yeah, fix the that, translation uh, side, no? Yeah. That, that, that is actually very interesting. And uh, we, have, uh, we have a CF uh, center here. Uh, they are very much into the using uh, this uh, phages. Yeah. Uh, to right. to kill uh, to kill uh, specific you know, they, bacteria. Yeah. Yeah. In the lung, uh, they have uh, Burgdorferia sepacea and other very nasty bugs uh, that are resistant to antibiotics. So they're trying to do this. It's but what I found is that lung physiology and liver physiology in terms of CFTR are completely different. Mm. Uh, it's uh, that's an, an interesting observation, right? You know how how these uh, um, how these different mutation impact on organ physiology in a different way. Uh, even the ciliary, the ciliary uh, mutation, the ciliary protein impact the uh, liver and kidney in a different way. And uh, the gene dosage, for example, is completely different. Uh, it seems that the liver is more sensitive to a partial decrease in the gene dosage, where the kidney uh, gene is to be completely out. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's amazing how much uh, there is still to understand uh, even after having identified um, <laughs> the gene defect in the monogenic defect, it's still, you know. Uh, yeah, there are three decades. Already. Yeah, decades, uh, 30 years at, at least, I think. Of yeah, the, even more. Uh, yeah. and, we're still, and we're still trying to understand what's, what is wrong. Oh, and every time you, you, you find something, there's a next stage. Uh, and, 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 uh, and that's, but that's part of, of the fun, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Okay. If there's no other question, thank you very much, um, Mario, for your time, your wisdom, and sharing with us a lot of data. Uh, some of them unpublished, which is very uh, important. And uh, we'll get in touch soon. Take okay. care. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.